So uh, in this chapter, chapter eight, uh, we're going to be looking at some of the kind of, I guess, maybe a little bit non less mathematical aspects of regression and when is it wise to do a regression versus when is it maybe not so wise. Um, and so the first thing we'll look at, we'll, we'll continue to talk a little bit about residuals. And we, we the second video for chapter seven uh, went into residuals and how they can um, help us to know if we should do a linear regression or not. And like it says here, uh, looking at the residuals is the easiest way to check for linearity. So um, one of the things I, I kind of said in that video is sometimes you can see a scatter plot with a little bit of a curve and it's hard to tell, uh, is it straight enough or is maybe the curve is, maybe is it curved a little bit too much? And so if we look at this example, this is a good um, uh, indicator of this. So this uh, scatter plot is looking at penguins and penguins have a particular heart rate when they're on the land and then they go underwater for however long, and then the heart rate starts to drop. And so the scatter plot looks at how that trends over the duration of being underwater. Um, so we can see a uh, negative association. So we're definitely trending downward. And R squared is 71.5. So that indicates that, well, if we interpret that the way we did in chapter seven, 71% of the variation in the heart rate uh, can be accounted for by the variation in duration. Then we have the predicted heart rate regression. And so on average for each minute, the penguin is underwater, its heart rate declines 5.47 beats per minute. So that's interpreting the slope that we talked about. The predicted heart rate before the dive is 96.9. Okay, so, um, just basically, it's kind of a review of what we did in chapter seven. And now let's look at the residual plot. This can tell us something that we might not see from the regression. Uh, so if you remember when we talked about residual plots uh, in the last uh, chapter, we really want there to be nothing interesting. We want it to be very scattered, uh, no pattern, uh, no relationship at all. And we want about half of the points to be above this zero line and about half to be below. And what we see here is you can see a bend. So it does kind of go like this. And so what that means is um, at the beginning, we have a lot of points that are above what we would find to be the regression line. As we move along, they tend to be below where we'd see the re regression line. And then as we move along, they go back up. And so that's not what you want to see. What you want to see is the whole way you have some points that are above and some points that are below. And so that's not what we see. And so um, that's, not, that's not a good indicator that this would be a good model. And another thing to point out, so it's very spread out here. It gets a little bit less, or a lot less spread out as we move along. So that's also not really a good, good sign. Uh, we talked about last time about examining the histogram of the residuals, and we said it needs to be normal, symmetric, unimodal, uh, centered right at zero. And so as you can see, this is almost normal, but uh, we maybe have a little bit heavier on this side. And then we do have these over here, these extreme values that it kind of comes up again, which that's not good either. You want it to taper off on both sides and not really uh, have another increase on the extreme ends. Um, so all those things, those are all kind of things to look at. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those, it can be a judgment call, but then also it can, it can also, we can have all signs pointing towards maybe this is the best uh, regression model that we could get. So, uh, all right. So the next, topic is called extrapolation. And I mentioned this in, in the last chapter when we did the hurricane uh, model where we had the central pressure and the maximum wind speed. And uh, we and I said when we interpreted the y-intercept, y-intercept was, I don't remember, I think it was 900 something. And 
so we looked at the, the X values and the X values were in a particular range and uh, the zero X being zero was far away from all the data. So that's what's called extrapolating. So the farther away from X, the less trust we can should place in the predicted value of Y. And that's what I said in that one is even if you don't know anything about hurricanes, if your if your data is a particular range, you don't want to make a prediction for an X value that is far from that range of data. Like maybe you could go a little bit outside, but you really don't want to go very far outside of where your data are. Uh, so when you when you get into that new X territory, that's called extrapolation. And the reason it's questionable is because it assumes nothing has changed. Uh, so it assumes that for the relationship between X and Y is the same for all X and all Y. So that's typically not a good good idea. Uh, and here's, a, here's an example of showing that that's not a good idea. So predicting gas prices in the future. Uh, we have the predicted price 1311 plus 689 times the years since 1970. So this would assume, and the data would go from zero up through 12, which would be 1982. Now, if you want to predict the price of oil, um, and this is price of oil, I guess it doesn't cost that much, even though it seems like it does. Um, for 2017, which would be 47 years after 1970, this model would predict 337, but it actually was 55. And the reason is because um, over short periods of time, things can move linearly, but things do not typically move linearly forever. And so linear regression works for a certain period of time, but it, it rarely, if ever, works for an indefinite period of time. And so this is a good case of that because prices don't go up just in a linear way forever. Um, there is fluctuation and, you know, this is a good example of that. So the model predicts 337, actual in 2017 was 55. So um, in the 1970s, if you know your history, world prices went, went way up, uh, way above where they ever did. So, uh, all right. So let's talk about, so let's talk about um, outliers a little bit. And so this is the election of 2000. We have uh, Pat Buchanan, Ralph Nader, and how many how many votes did Nader get versus Buchanan? And we see uh, R is 42.8 percent. That's not super great. And we have a regression line. Always draw a scatter plot and investigate the outlier. So the outlier obviously is way up here. And so here, here's the general trend, but then we have this one county up here uh, that Pabby Kennedy did very well in versus Nader didn't do as well, relatively speaking. Um, so the blue line shows the regression without the outlier, and you can see it's, it's down here. The red line is with the outlier, and you can see the outlier did pull this up um, a little bit. But the 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 big difference, you can see R squared goes from 42.8% to 82.1%. And so that, that shows that outliers, one outlier, depending on how far it is, um, can really, really affect this, this regression model. Um, so we have, we have two different types of these points, uh, leverage and influential points. Uh, so a data point whose X value is far from the, the mean of the rest of the X values is said to have high leverage. And a data point or leverage points have the potential to pull, pull strongly on the regression line. A point is influential if omitting it from the analysis changes the model enough to make a meaningful difference. So the influence is determined by the residual and, and the leverage. All right, so here, here's an example. Um, Bozo the Clown, shoe size and IQ. Uh, so almost all the variation accounted for by the model is from one point. So if we include Bozo's IQ and shoe size, R squared is 24.8. If we don't, R squared is 0.7. So that indicates 
it's a very influential point because if you put that in, all of a sudden the model is a lot better than when you take it out. Uh, what if Bozo has an IQ of 50? Then the slope of the line goes from 0.96, which is here, to negative 0.69, which is there. And so the line follows the shoe size. That's a high leverage point. And you can see um, compared to all the X values, this, this is very far from that. So doctors in life expectancy. And this is going to get into the uh, uh, causation kind of thing. So there is a linear relationship between the square root of doctors per person. Um, now, why do they do square root? So that's something we don't really get into in this class. Um, but sometimes taking the square root can, can help linearize the uh, scatter plot. So doctors per person and life expectancy. So we can see a linear relationship there. So should we send, so the more doctors per person, the higher the life expectancy. Should we send doctors to countries with low life expectancies? And if so, would that cause the life expectancies to go up? Is the question. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a stronger linear relationship between TVs per person and life expectancy. So maybe we should send more TVs than doctors to, to increase the life expectancy. Uh, so these are what's called there's what's called a lurking variable here. Uh, so although both examples show a positive linear relationship, this does not mean we should send doctors or TVs to countries with low life expectancies. Although probably you should send we could send doctors. I mean doctors would be good. Doctors are good everywhere. Um, but that doesn't mean life expectancies will increase just because of that. So there could be a, a lurking variable such as standard of living. So do not confuse correlation with causation. We talked about that in chapter six. Uh, so those are just a few things to consider. Um, so like I said, this chapter doesn't really have any math, um, although you are kind of looking at some numbers, but it's mostly just kind of getting familiar with these things that can indicate we're looking at a good regression model or a not so good one. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me.